could be in the genus uh, Deltosiathus or Stephanosiathus. And then Vonella also, I've, I have personally collected it from so, uh, greater than 3,000 meters before, but um, it's definitely one of those that's exceptionally deep. Uh, yeah, it's, it's tough for these uh, types of calcifying organisms to make a living down here. But cup corals are the ones, or some of the exceptions. They can live quite deep. A lot of that is dependent on local oceanography, though. So if the conditions are favorable for calcification, you'll find that they live deeper. Or if the food supply is greater, you might find them deeper, and so on. Nice nodules, though. Yeah, it's oh, yeah. Another extensive nodule field. Fair number of boulders, though, spurt, uh, spread around the nodule field. We didn't see this too much on the last cruise. It was mostly just nodules. Boulders are very interesting. It tells you something about how the flow conditions are. So you have shadows on certain sides of the boulder. Uh. There we go, Brisingid sea star. Oh, there's one of those pancake urchins I was talking oh, about. Oh, is it really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have to find really these fast. little feet. They run away. They run away? Oh, yeah. No, no. <laughs> Not quickly. Oh, okay. Yeah. Go for zoom. A slow moving, lumpy pancake. Like relative for an urchin. Yeah, it's all relative in the deep sea. With its walking shoes? Yep. If you there zoom in on the bottom, you can see some of the. Bottom uh, spines have white walking, yeah, walking parts. Um, cool. It's thought that they're able to okay, know, get better on. traction in soft sediment. Actually, there's a really cool fecal pile uh, right at the bottom of that urchin, so oh, it's been feeding on something. Wondering. Oh yeah, I did see. Did yeah. you did you get some captures of that area there? Yeah, we got them. Okay. I think. Those like little bead looking things were the yeah. fecal matter? Yeah, yeah. So the huh. their their oral oral uh, surface is on the bottom, right? But the top is where the fecal pellets come out. And if you Wait, watch really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh if you watch like the shallow water ones um feed on algae or something, you can see them, you know, cast small pellets out. I have never thought about how an urchin pooped before. <laughs> Now I know. The things you learn. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're switching off in the video chair. Nice watch, everyone. Thank you. All right. We're approaching a watch change, so we'll have some new voices come in, and it'll be a few minutes before we can get started again. But this is a great place to hand off. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for tuning in with us. We'll probably be diving for another 12 hours or more, so we'll be on for a while.
Good morning, everybody. We're about to complete this move. I've been advised to not let that happen. Yeah. So we're going to do a 265. I don't know. I think they're putting in like 100 meters, just slow. Cool. Bridge nav. Good morning. Can we get uh, 100 meters uh, bearing 265? Yeah. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Dwight at the ISC, checking audio on SPL. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Dwight. Loud and clear. Oh, too loud. <laughs> we'll give you that <laughs> idea. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's an adjustment on your end. <laughs> I'll try to talk softer. Oh, no, you're fine. No, we're just it's kidding. all good. Oh, yeah. Morning, back row. Let me know when you're ready for a check-in. We are just getting set up, so we'll be just a moment. She's just glaring at you. It's all good. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Are you guys on SPL? Oh, okay. They're just doing their other conversations. Roger. What's our transfer speed? Do we find out where that is yet? What if it's this number?
Perfect. Okay. Oh. Oh, that might be the north and the east or something. Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. <clears throat> cool. Yeah, totally. Does this show up on the move screen? come back to that okay we're just getting some data sorted out back here so we are currently diving on our still our first dive of the Lu'ua'ea Hiki Ke Kualuna Kai expedition this dive is expected to last approximately 24 hours we started yesterday afternoon Hawaiian time so looks like we're just going by a little bit of coral there um, we're about to start making introductions. This is our early Hawaii time, 4 a.m. watch crew. So we'll start introductions in the back row here. Coral. Hello. Hello. All right, we're seeing some nice uh, unbranched bamboo corals here at the bottom today. This is your watch lead, Megan Putz, from the University of Hawaii. And we are currently at a depth of 2,906 meters. So watch lead would probably be a good time to kind of check in in the overall view if you're ready for that. Yeah, let's take, out, uh, take a look at the overall view. Um, okay, I don't, can you see high pack? Um, yep, I can see high pack. All right, so we are on our way to waypoint five. Um, we've been advised to keep the ship moving as much as possible because they had a lot of issues getting uh, momentum going with the current forces. So we're in a hundred meter move um, at two six five, um, but we can do a lot at the speed we're going. And uh, yeah, that's where we are. I'll zoom out more so you can get a bigger kind of picture view. So there we are coming up on that plateau and a little less than halfway through okay. the full dive plan. It looks like we're coming across a sort of flattish area right yeah, now. Yeah, that little, well, yeah, we're coming across a pretty flat area, um, exactly. And then we'll have another steep slope up into that little kind of plateau knob um, at waypoint six. Great. Um, how are we in terms of being able to snap zoom on items? of interest in terms of the what sorry um like doing snap zooms on different some some of these corals oh, since sure. there aren't that many feel free to always ask for snap zooms or samples or whatever and i'll just tell you if we don't have time but always try to make it happen okay and i um we were also advised you were doing samples every 500 meters or so and to expect one around waypoint five does that sound right um we are going to do a geological um sample Again at 2,500 meters. Okay. It's going to get steeper. It is going to get steeper. After five. At that point, we might have to either slow down or... Stop sampling. Either one is fine, but that's not for a bit yet, I guess. Yeah, you got, let me measure. Oh, like 400 meters. Yeah, okay. Let's decide later. All right, now that we've gotten a bit settled and now know where we are and what we're doing during this watch, so let's introduce ourselves here in the back row. I'm Megan Putz, your watch lead from the University of Hawaii. 
And then uh, to my right, I have our data logger. Hi, I'm Corley Rodriguez. I'm a grad student at the Graduate School of Oceanography at the University of Rhode Island. To my left. I am Abrian Carrington. I am a professional illustrator and your science communication fellow for this watch. And we have a, a guest as well. Kind of guest, kind of the biggest deal. And uh, excuse me, Bob Ballard, president of the Ocean Exploration Trust, professor at the Graduate School of Oceanography at the University of Rhode Island. And in our front row, we have our ROV team currently flying the vehicle. When you guys are ready, if you could introduce yourselves. I'm Trevor. I'm sitting in the Herc seat. Antonella, Argus pilot. I'm Erin. I'm in the video engineer seat. And Erin Heffron, navigator and mapper in the navigation seat. Bridge nav. Does anyone know when Dwight, if Dwight is still on the party line? Can we get another 100 meter move bearing 265, please? Uh, what was the question about Dwight, sorry? Do we know if he's uh, on SPL? He did check in already, yeah. Okay. I don't know if he's still there. Uh, 0 0.3 is to transfer speed right now, Trevor. Thank you. Hey, guys, this is Jess at the Interspace Center. Dwight's walked out, but uh, it's been transferred to me. Hey, Jess. Hey, Carly. Uh, so Katie's here, and we're just getting set up. Um, is the camera person on your side ready to go to film you? I'm going to film from one of the cameras in the, uh, in the van. Awesome sauce. Yeah, so um, we'll get set up here. I'm going to get a camera on Katie, um, and then you'll have the camera ready on you. And then once you guys start chatting, I'm also going to take uh, this segment of the dive recording as well, so we can hear you guys conversing and see the live footage. Um, start in a in a minute or two sound good sounds great hey what's going on can we get a heads up oh uh, it's for the noaa <laughs> seminar next week we're getting some footage for that cool we're just uh having katie and coralie interact to demonstrate the uses of telepresence in the science world Roger. Uh, oxygen level has been consistently dropping oh, look and at dropping. That. Oh, That's a nice sponge. We have a really nice looking Spongy. sponge here. Let's take a nice look at this one. That's small. You can zoom in if you'd like. So you can see those green dots on the screen. They are 10 centimeters apart. So that gives you a kind of size estimate on this animal. Looks like a, uh, this is a glass sponge. And it is stocked. So you can see that there is a stock coming up out of the ground and into this sponge. Um, it's really, really interesting looking one. Come wide, please. Thank you. All right.
Coral thing. Like a great playground for a marine geologist. Got a lot of rocks there. And some smattering of corals and stuff. Are we interested in trying to focus on those as we go by? Or are you looking for particular items? Um, let's do some snap zooms on some of these uh, corals as we go by, and let's check out this nice Coolios. It is a um, zoom in on this guy, please. Yeah, this is a really interesting animal type of tunicate. Mm -hmm. It's on a stock. Coolioas. Come down in Delta. All right, Laura. Where's Katie? Hi, Carly. Good morning. Hi, Katie. How's your experience on the Nautilus so far? Good. Bonk. <laughs> Sorry. It's a little bumpy. <laughs> Bumbiness is to be expected. That's okay. I'm glad that your uh, conditions are calm enough for the dive to proceed. I was excited to hear the microphones spring to life in the middle of the night last night while I was working on something. <laughs> so have you sat, you didn't sit a watch during the dive last night, is that right? I was at the first dive when we were descending, but I didn't see any rocks. Okay. So this is your first time looking at the seafloor? Uh, well, I did come back <laughs> when they <had> rocks. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So what do you um, notice about the condition of the rocks here on the seafloor? There's a lot of like sediment on top of them, which I was kind of surprised about. Um, and also everyone seems to be surprised that there's no biology here. Or I'm surprised by that too. Barren. Um, one of the nice things about that is that it makes the geological sampling a little easier. Yeah. <laughs> and that might actually it might actually tell you a little something about the water environment that's relevant to the rocks. Yeah. In your case. So do you want to say a little bit about your objectives here? Yeah. For rock sampling? Yeah, sure. So um, what I'm trying to do here is collect water rock pairs. And so I will collect a rock. And at the same location, I will collect a water sample. And the hope is to be able to find some relationship between the metal and uh, like elemental content of the water and the rock. And what's special about the rocks? Uh, there's a lot of special things about the rocks, uh, compared <laughs> to 
earth crust, these rocks are extremely enriched in mm. uh, economically valuable metals and mm -hmm. rare earth elements. Um, so, for instance, the rocks that they grow upon, the basalt and volcanic crust, uh, are really depleted in these, but these rocks seem to be super enriched. Right, so you're looking for some evidence that tells us more about how these crusts grow and how they concentrate their metals. Yeah, exactly. These crusts yeah. were discovered in like the 70s, I think. Um, and, you know, the causes of formation and what controls their enrichments are still remain elusive to us. So we have some ideas of what sort of environments they do better to grow in, but there's a lot we still don't know. Indeed. So can you tell me a little bit about your sampling plan? Yeah, so we wanted to, we were hoping to uh, take some samples in the OMZ, but we actually went through the OMZ really early um, when I was, when we were descending. So, okay. yeah. Um, the, the top of the seamount does not intersect the OMZ, is that true? too deep uh, it might oh, okay then you'll get there later is that right okay no the mock <laughs> never mind it was 800 meters it will not okay. not at all Why? yeah okay <laughs> okay um and what do you what so the oxygen content to the water here so the reading is 97 is that an uncorrected reading do you know um let me see Hi, Kate. Okay, what did you say you saw your oxygen concentration as? Right here. What I see here is about 97. Yeah, that is the... I think that's the corrected. Right here. Okay. So... Maybe can you um, just suggest a little bit uh, what your study so far might tell you about what you expect the metal enrichment to be like in the crusts here based on that oxygen content? Do you remember from your poster? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, they're pretty high, so um, samples that I've looked at before have been collected in really kind of oxygen depleted zones, and that's it's when we see the oxygen depleted zones that we expect to find really metal rich crusts. So they're more depleted than this, so I expect to find not as metal rich crusts as some that I have found before. I agree. That's the hypothesis that you're going to test, right? It's actually fun, in fact, to be able to watch the oxygen sensor and kind of make a prediction in your head about where the crust composition is going to fall based on what you already know. And one of the nice things about um, the data that you've collected on other seamounts so far is that the sensor data from the ROV and the precise locations of the samples give you this really tight, um, tightly uh, related data set that lets you see those differences in the oxygen content of the water and relate it directly to the rock. Yeah. So it's exciting. Oh, you're getting into a zone here that's a little more sedimented. Yeah. So you told me you were surprised at how much sediment there was. Why are you surprised by that? Do you know how old, do we know roughly how old 
the seamount is? Uh, we I don't think we do. Uh, I think Adam was hoping to get some fresh rock uh, basalt samples for argon argon dating. That's definitely um, a goal to be sought after with these rocks. So this is fascinating to me. <laughs> the sort of character of the substrate right here. Because um, you know, every, every sort of black thing that you see is probably ferromanganese deposit that's on the rock underneath. Yeah. And this really sort of smooth, um, I mean, I know it looks bumpy and kind of knobby, but it's compared to the kind of rocks that Herc can actually pick up, this is an incredibly smooth surface that you're looking at. Um, this is fascinating, it's like a huge plate of ferromanganese deposit that's not broken up by anything. Yeah. Could you guys maybe coordinate any kind of a rock pickup? Not we. Much as I would love for you to try to pick this up, you couldn't. I don't think you could possibly grab it. No. You need extra. <laughs> extra we need tools. some edges. Yeah, so one of the things that's really challenging with ROV sampling of rocks is that a lot of the hard rocks on the ocean floor are are really hard. And in fact, the vehicle doesn't have the leverage to break them. And so in fact, we have to rely on nature to have broken the rocks for us a little bit so that Herc is able to pick them up. So here, there's just nothing broken. There's no edge to grab onto. So you'll for sampling, I'm sure you'll have to wait until you get something that nature gives you to pick up. But at the same time, like this, this texture is really fascinating. I'm not sure I've seen anything like this on the seafloor before. No, neither have I, not in previous samples. Oh, are you, look at that. You know what, you should take a scoop if you could. Can you do that? Do you guys have a scooper or a slurp maybe even? We that looks like scoop, the, we do um, have a slurper. Yeah. So let's see if we can slurp some of it up. I love, I love how you're nudging the bottom there with the front of the vehicle to see how um, soft it is. Yeah, it looked pretty soft. Thanks for doing that. I, yeah, I think the slurp would be a great thing to pull up some of these pebbles maybe. I don't know how well rocks will go through the slurp, but we can absolutely try. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Does it have a filter on it? It has a one millimeter grid uh, filter on it, yes. Okay, the rocks may not go through then. Well, uh, I'm not sure it's worth it. That is the <laughs> filter so they don't go into the pump. There are rocks yeah. right here, Kelly. Oh. There are bigger Bob rocks, Ballard. yeah. You see them? Oh. And a floaty thing. This would be a are good, there, oh, look, oh, good place to sample. Timing. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Yeah, These are, this is a great spot to sample, if that's okay. You want to get a rock sample? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's see how welded it is. What's been striking me, I've been off and on through the whole dive, is the barren nature of the landscape. I've never in 65 years of crawling across the ocean floor seen a more desolate terrain than the one we're looking at. And it's sort of odd. I'm, so I'm trying to understand why the oxygen level is reasonably high, why it's so desolate. So that'll be interesting when we crest it and get up to the summit. But uh, it's strikingly barren. I agree with you, Bob, that this is really stunning. And it reminds me of some of the sort of desert areas that we saw in the very strong yeah. OMZ on the Socorro dives in 2017, uh, where we, we saw, I mean, it wasn't even as barren as this, and that was one of the lowest hey, oxygen sorry to interrupt. Zones in uh, what kind of rock are we looking for here? Any one for... you can, uh, you know, baseball size. Or baseball whatever. size. Sounds good. Or, or yeah, that's, that would be perfect. 
Okay. The question is whether it's cemented and you can't. So look for. Are you just pushing them? You're, you're pushing them, right? So they, oh. they, you can pick yeah, them up. Yeah, I mean, Go I, ahead. I just saw him bulldoze. Follow ahead. that one. That's right. Oh, right there. Yeah. That one. That one. Grab the baseball size yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they look like. He That's was a little bigger than a baseball. So they look like they are, they'll be, uh, won't be cemented. Let's see. Yep. That's great. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. You like that on the starboard side there, back row? Yeah, starboard A. Starboard A. Forward. Yeah, I just so taken by the barren nature. I, I, I have yet. I think they saw an Ely fish. I have yet to see a fish in the whole dive. All right, go ahead. We've seen. And for Coralie, oh, seen coral for Coralie's sponges. interest, yeah. that nice black. Very black crust on the out. Yeah, that's just um, that's exactly what she's looking for. Let me know when you're ready for a sample salvo. Once you're around the side, I'll open the box. Ready for it? We're going for A. Is it too big for A? We'll see. Nope. Nice job. Perfect fit. That was an A sample. Great job. <laughs> What's our sample number, Science? That was 10. Zero, one, zero. Zero, one, I zero. think for dive gotcha. Thank you. seven of them geologic, three biologic. Is that it? Yeah. Are that you only doing Niskins at specific rock samples? Well, Katie, what do you think? We were planning on doing a Niskin rock pairing at... 2,500 meters. 2,500. Sounds good. Roger. Nice sponge. Yeah. I think that's Can fine. I another for... 100 zero, zero meter yeah. move, bearing 265. Thank you. Haven't seen any. I mean, I don't know how we would classify that. Would you say that's just flow brushes? It, what caused it to be uh, of that? You know, as you know, this is a one-time volcano. So that must have been associated with the initial formation of it. Sort of a flow breccia that's been smoothed by deposition or what? What's your thoughts, Kelly? So uh, it's hard to tell without seeing what it's like a little further up slope, right? Because if it is a breccia like that, then we'd expect maybe some steeper terrain with um, bigger blocks as you go further up the slope it's relatively the steep off to the right on the sonar yeah. uh and when you look at the overall bathymetry uh that we're heading up slope it's beginning to steepen quite a bit dead ahead now look then at that. i think that look at the plating makes nature sense. see the plating nature of this this ladies yeah this platy stuff looks interesting too i i wonder if you might be able to grab a sample of this as well. Yeah, yes, look. we can. Uh, just Yay. Just, yeah, uh, we'll see. This almost looks like a fluid flow that's fractured. Are you settling the vehicle, Trevor? Or? It might be attached. We'll find out. We'll I'm going to give it a it, little I'll bump here. Okay. See what happens. Hmm. Yeah, you can poke it if you want. But I'm betting it's going to be too attached for us. I'll bet you it's welded. Can you reach it? Or, no, or just Hang on. the fluid flow that you're going to have difficult time breaking off. Let's see. Uh, 
That ain't moving. That ain't moving. You're right. Okay, come out of there, and I'm going to try another one. Good luck. It's really helpful, though, to know, actually, that this stuff, that you, when you see it in this texture, is really massive. So even, even though we can't handle it, knowing something about it is really Now we're helpful. more up into flow breccia. That might be it. Oh, yeah, for the look at that. Ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's like the last one. I mean, <laughs> it'll probably be looser, but we don't need them in this closely space. All right, you can unless really they're are. totally different textures. That's pretty much what we just picked up. Okay, guys, I think I'm going to be signing off from the ISC here, but I will be um, tuning in on the website and you know, if I see anything cool, I'll, uh, I'll type it in the chat box or, um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll pop back over here a little later in the day. I'm really excited. This is, uh, it, it's so much fun even just be sitting here in Rhode Island watching <laughs> and participating with you guys. So thanks for the opportunity this morning. Yeah, thanks for calling in, Katie. Have, have a great cruise, Coralie. It's thanks. nice to talk to you all. You too. Bye. Bye. I see on the uh, chat board someone wanting to know the costs of these operations. Uh, typically, when you're conducting a what we call a 24-7 ROV operation, we do different operating tempos, and they come in with different costs. Uh, mapping operations are much less expensive to do, so a typical a mapping operation is around $40,000 a day, something to that effect. Uh, that's why we like to do 24 hours a day, so we're constantly working. The same is true and particularly true of ROV operations. ROV operations are much more uh, human intense. We have three uh, watches. Uh, four on eight off watches and as I go around the room right now and I start counting the bodies that are actually on watch one two three four five six seven people uh, and that's just the ones in the command center on watch so t typically those operations are about sixty thousand dollars a day and again because of those costs you you want to get stay down uh, we like to work constantly until we've exhausted uh, what we're trying to do on the, on a particular location. So we've been down, I think we, we launched around 10 o'clock our time local. Was it, I can't remember, to noon. It was, it was, yeah, okay, when we actually got in the water. Yeah. Five p.m. Uh, and so we've been down, what, how many hours so far? We've gone through two watches, eight hours? Yep, we've been down for about eight hours. Yeah, so we've gone through two watches. This watch just switched over. I like to be around when the watches change. Uh, so this is our third watch, and we'll just keep uh, going on until we. And there's no, there's no end point for us. If the science or discoveries take us longer, so be it. But we're hoping that this will be around a 24-hour. Five, and then I'm curious to see when we summit if there's an increase in marine life as we get up to the top, uh, and then we'll just jump over, over do a quick recovery, and we'll jump over to the next seamount and get back down to the bottom. Hope that answered your question. See in the sonar, it's starting to steepen. And you can see it in the contours on the bathymetric map. 
So it's going to be the tighter these are, the steeper it is. Yeah, we've got a question about uh, from a little bit back about um, how many years of work led to where we're sitting now. Talking about, I like, wish they were one of the awesome biologists on board. Um, we have a ton of different backgrounds, and it takes a bunch of different people to run a ship. So, I mean, we have our. Um, I always like to bring up our uh, kitchen staff because without them, we would all perish. So um, there are many different ways to get on a ship, but if anybody wants to talk about their background, I welcome them too. Well, I, I guess I'll start since my background is in marine biology, specifically studying deep sea coral and sponge communities. Um, so I am your watch lead and helping to lead this dive in order to pick out good biological samples and sort of direct what's happening um, during the dive. And so That's I started cool. my career um, at Ecker College uh, in Florida. Is that the inside of the Learning about marine science. And then I went on to do my master's at Hawaii Pacific University. And after that, I started working at the University of Hawaii, um, annotating ROV video. And so I Bridge nav, make another notes one zero on zero every animal move. that we're seeing during dives just like Two, this six, one. Five. And that data goes into a repository um, where scientists from around the world can download and use that data uh, for their own studies. So that's sort of what I do. Um, but, you know, that's sort of your typical biological role. But other people have some really, really interesting backgrounds. Uh, so this is Corley, um, again, so I don't know if you guys, I guess, I don't know, I think it was on the SPL, me and Katie talking, so I'm sure everyone heard that conversation. Um, my background is in geology, I graduated from UCLA uh, with that degree, then I came, I always had an interest in geochemistry, and I joined Katie Kelly's lab, and she had this project on ferromanganese crusts. That was really interesting to me. Um, yeah. Uh, what I do at UCLA, so I'm specifically working on this ferromanganese crust project. I am finished analyzing samples from two previous Nautilus cruises. And so I'm trying to collect more samples for another chapter, perhaps. And one cool thing about working at uh, URI the Graduate School of Oceanography at URI is that we have access to the Marine Geological Samples Laboratory, which is one of four NSF funded rock repositories in the country. Um, so a lot of these samples from the Nautilus cruises go back to our, uh, to MGSL is what we call it. Um, and it's essentially a huge library of rocks and core samples we have as well. And anyone in the country uh, can request to like rent them like a book. And so yeah, it's a really cool way for, you know, everyone to have access to these samples. In the spirit of continuing in the back row, I'm the uh, science communication fellow, Avery and Carrington. Um, and I probably have the weirdest background of anybody here. Um, I'm actually a professional illustrator, so I don't have a scientific background or scientific education background. Um, I went to school for art, and I did more recently get a um, grad certificate in 
GIS cartography, even though I was already making maps, I thought, you know, it's good to be GIS certified. So, uh, yeah, my, my background is in visual storytelling, which is why I'm here telling stories of the deep. So that was a bachelor's and a grad certificate. Yeah. Not yeah, not completely out of line with what I'd expect. So Coralie, do you think that the uh, cementing, uh, you know, the all of these plates and the uh, interesting um substrate that we're dealing with has anything to do with the amount of biology that we're seeing? Can you repeat the question? Do you think that um, any of like the plating and uh, the, of the um, substrate has anything to do with the amount of biology that we're seeing? That's a question from the chat. I think that might be a better question from Megan. So Megan. I, I, I'm, I'm not completely sure why we're not seeing as much biology as the previous cruises, um, yeah. So someone was also asking about insight. the uh, about the carbon level. So um, with Maybe. substrate like this, where it's looser, you're not going to see as many large corals and sponges, yeah. just because there isn't a good place to attach. Um, what we're seeing right now, this sort of pebbly, gravelly nodule field, isn't a good place for for large animals to, to attach. So that's why you're not seeing those types of typical coral forests that we are used to seeing on these types of seamounts. Um, the lack of really large biology can also be a function of our depth. Um, so we are still a bit deep to be seeing these high density deep sea coral and sponge communities. Uh, as we get a little bit shallower, uh, it's likely that we'll see a few more corals um, but you never know what you're going to see 